Avenir, is a global career guidance event, to empower students, and assist them, in identifying their ideal future career path. It, was conceptualized, by the board of directors, of Indian schools, in Sultanate of Oman. The first Avenir, was organized at, Indian School Alma Bela, in the year 2018. In 2019, Indian School El Seeb, conducted the program. Indian School Musket, conducted the first virtual Avenir, in the year, 2020. Avenir 2021, was conducted virtually, by Indian School, Al Wadi Al Kabir. In 2022, the flagship school, in Oman. Indian School Bosher, is all set, to fly the flag, higher, by conducting Avenir 2022, in hybrid mode. Our impeccable planning, devoted team, unmatched resources, guarantee, a memorable event. The five-day event, will be held from, Thursday, October 13, 2022, to Tuesday, October 18, 2022. Prominent achievers, educators, and industry experts will address, the audience. Universities, and educational institutes, from different corners of the globe will present, themselves to the audience of, Avenir 2022. The event is open, to all educational boards, including CBSE, ICSE, IGCSE, and IB. It will provide, comprehensive career guidance, to students to pursue, their passions at national, and international universities. Avenir 2022 guarantees a wealth of information and awareness on 21st century courses, scholarships, internships, and career placements. This event will assist students in discovering their ideal future career path. Let us gather together for this five days of excitement, effulgence, enlightenment, exploration, and exaltation. Let's join Avenir 2022 to discover you. The arts and humanities teach us who we are and what we can be. They lie at the very core of the culture of which we're a part by Ronald R. Good morning, one and all. Let me walk you over the listings for the session we have today. The big event, Avenue 2022, hashtag discover you is currently in its second session 
a short introduction and a video featuring our distinguished speaker will appear after the welcoming message. We will then invite the distinguished speaker to make her presentation. Following the lecture, we'll ask our spe special guest to participate in the Q&A segment where the questions of the audience will be put forth by the moderator. The university representative will take up the ongoing session. There will be a description of the courses that are offered and the admission procedures. With a vote of thanks, we will call this meeting to a close. The calling of the humanities is to make us truly human in the best sense of the word. The imagination is an innate gift, but it needs refinement and cultivation. Opening quote to the session. Good morning, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Welcome to Avenir 2022, hashtag discover you, a global career guidance program launched by Indian School Bausher under the aegis of the Board of Directors of Indian Schools in Oman. On behalf of Indian School Bausher, I, Saina Basata of grade 8 and I, Arsha Fatim of grade 8 as well, take the proud privilege of expressing a profound gratitude to His Majesty Sultan Haitham bin Tariq Al Said for the altruistic and noble benevolence showered on the Indian diaspora in the Sultanate of Amman. May the Almighty shower his choicest blessings on His Majesty, and may this nation experience peace and everlasting prosperity. All the students, parents and teachers for being a part of Avenue 2022. Hashtag discover you. Thank you one and all for your benign presence here this morning. An awesome civil service official by profession, a woman, with two adorable children, born and brought up in Nagawan, Assam. She graduated from CSA UAT Kanpur with a master's degree in agriculture in 2006. She finished first in her class at the university's agri extension. As the top student in her class, she successfully passed the civil service exam in 2013. She has worked in the government for nine years and in the banking industry for six years. Because of his vastness and ability to assist the public while adhering to governmental laws and regulations, public administration is a subject that she always held dear to her heart. Let me introduce you to our eminent speaker, Ms. Mirzana Hussain. We are honored to have you here, ma'am. Let us all watch a prelude of the speaker of the session. like to request the audience to kindly post your queries in the chat box. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, please join me in welcoming our speaker, Ms. Mirzana Hussain, who will be talking on the topic public administration. That platform is all yours, ma'am. Thank you so much. Namaste. A very good Good morning to everyone present here. I'm Rizana Hussain speaking for Avenir 2022. Hashtag discover you. 
It's a great honor to be a form to be a part of this forum, the forum that the Indian School Borsha has provided me today. I'm immensely grateful to the school authorities, to the board of directors, to the learning teachers, and the vibrant student community. Well, I'm here to speak about public administration. Why should a young children, uh, global leaders of tomorrow, should take up a career in public administration. Well, I would like to first tell you that growing up, I was never sure as to what would be my career, what I wanted to do when I grew up. But I knew for sure that I wanted to help my community. I wanted to give back to my community, which held me, which nourished me to be in the position that I'm today. Therefore, I firstly took up a career in banking. I worked there for six years and I work in the sector of agricultural loaning. So as you know, people basically in India, agriculture is the backbone of our economy. And loan helps the farmers to achieve their targets to a very great extent. And then I worked on in the banking sector and I worked on to help my community but I always wanted to be a part of my community, to blend in my community. And that is when I knew that public administration is the scope for me, is the place where I wanted to be. Well, to tell you, dear children, what public administration is all about, let me give you an overview. Public administration is the implementation of government policies. It is the handholding of the masses by the government Governments around the world, world envisage policies for the benefit of its people based on their demographic mix. These policies may range from providing basic health care and education to providing roads and infrastructure and building industries, which is required for that region, for that country. So we have, as public administrators, we help formulate those policies, what is required for our region. And we help our masses link the bridge between the government and the people as to what they need and what we can provide under the greater ambit of the constitutional framework of a country. Public administration is the backbone of any government or ruling entity. The scope of public administration is really varied and it is wide ranging. Everything that comes under governmental delivery of services, policies, and benefits to the people comes under the ambit of public administration. Public administration helps us to work in the field of food security, in the field of social security, improving livelihoods, agriculture, veterinary, fisheries, horticulture, in promoting culture and tourism, in honing life skills, in improving the livelihoods of people, in preserving traditional knowledges, in building a scientific temperament, and in promoting sciences. So you know, it is a varied field. And a person who is interested in whatever field he is interested, public administration gives you a scope to work in that field. Definitely a student would find a job role which fits his or her interest or her capabilities. But one thing which I want to put across is that for being an efficient public administrator, one should have an attitude of empathy. You know, you should know your capabilities, but one of your best capability would be to serve for the community, to understand what the community wants. You have to blend in in the circumstances. You have to blend in in your community to give best what they deserve, right? So my word to my nine to 12 graders here would be to keep a, a really open mind, to have zeal and passion to work for your community, to give back to your community, because this is the profession which would allow you to be yourself, to really discover you yourself and give back to your community within your capabilities. So how, do, uh, how does the administration work? The administration is run by officers. These officers are maybe from the national cadre or the state cadres. 
like in India, we have two cadres. We have the union cadre and we have the state cadres. So the Union Public Service Commission conducts yearly comparative examinations for entry into the IS, which is the Indian Administrative Services, the most important administrative services, and the officers run the important departments in the country. Likewise, all the states conduct their own civil service examinations. So for entry into the civil services, one has to take the comparative examination. But to take the comparative examination, a, dis a discipline is not limited. A graduate in any discipline can take up a course, take up a comparative examination and enter the civil services and serve their people. I would just like to main, mention a few names of the leading institutes where training to civil servants are provided. And these are the Lee Kua Yu School of Public Policy in Singapore, the Lal Bahadur Shastri National Academy of Administration in Missouri, and the Assam Administrative Staff College, a very own training institute here in Guwahati, Assam. Where a civil servant can find job civil servants would find job in the government. They are basically the governmental backbone. Apart from that, a person with a public administration as a background, they can work in the NGOs, they can work in policy and research organizations, they can work in private businesses, in consulting firms, and form part of think tanks. So basically a country's think tanks are the creme de la creme of the civil servants, the public sector servants of that country. What are the challenges that we are facing as public administrators today? Well, to name a few, I would like to mention conflict management, which is a very important challenge that we have to face in our day-to-day -day delivery of services. Well, conflict management is not only management of conflicts between man and man, but also man and nature, as we see in today's world. We see many natural disasters which were not occurring in days earlier today, but then it's occurring now. And those are the man and nature conflict. How do we help the public in such situations? Because our resources are always limited. The supply is always less than the demand within the limited resources that we have within the governmental guidelines and the greater framework, how do we provide the services to make the society happy, to make the people comfortable? Firstly, we have to be very calm and very decisive in these situations. We have to maintain peace and order in the society. We have to provide relief and rescue operations oversee those operations. We have to see that resources are actually sent out to the people who are in dire necessity. As I've already said, resources are always a constraint. So within that constrained availability of resources that we have in our hands, we have to make sure that it reaches the most needy in the society. Well, another challenge in today's world is moving towards a virtual world. After the COVID-19 pandemic hit the world, the world has seen a, seen a paradigm shift towards ICT, the information communication technology. Everything is online. Every, we have a virtual as a, a virtual horizontal world that is going on around us. So we have to deliver the services in the quickest possible way. And we have to keep up with the latest technologies. We have to reach out to the remotest corners so that is another challenge that public administrators of today's world are facing. Well, how to prepare for a job in public administration? How to prepare to be a civil servant? A graduation in any discipline is the basic requirement. It doesn't have to be limited to any discipline, like a graduate in humanities and sciences or commerce can take up a job in public administration and be a civil servant. Knowledge in, of history, of geography, and of economy of the region they're working in and the world at large is definitely a must. You must also have good language skills and mathematical skills. 
there is no limitation on the discipline of study, right? So, dear friends, the world is your stage. Give your best shot. Work on your capabilities. Have faith in your circumstances. Make informed decisions. Be adequately confident. Level up your reading. Improve your confidence by observing and absorbing. I tell you, you be adequately confident and not overconfident. Overconfident makes a person complacent. It's a limitation to our learning. We should never be overconfident. We should just be adequately confident to face the world at our best possible knowledge. Be always grateful. I tell you that today's students, children of today are tomorrow's global leaders. Leaders don't force people to follow. They invite on the journey. With this, I believe my young children would be impressed to have a career in public administration, to give back to the community, to their society and the world at large. There are many things that you can do in having a career in public administration. This will really uplift you, help you discover yourself and your community. As I come close to my talk today, I have jotted down a few lines for my children, Sammy, my Sarah, as well as my nephews who are hearing me from across the globe in the USA, Aiden and Zida. Here it goes for you. I will never give up. I will never stop these tears to flow. I will never stop the surge within the heart. Just as the ocean gets its power from the waves, so the spirit gets its power from within. I will never give up till I reach where I'm meant to be. Till I reach where I should be, I will never give up. I thank you all again for giving me this opportunity to connect with you, to connect with the student community, a community which is so close to my heart because they are the ones who will be leading us in the future. I thank you all and I do earnestly hope that you will get inspired to take up a career in public administration, in public services. Thank you all. That was an extraordinary and inspiring session by you, ma'am. Your creative and fun-filled session enlightened us and kept each one of us engaged. Now, we would like to request our speaker, Ms. Mirzana, to kindly answer a few questions put forth by the audience. For this, may I now invite the moderator of the session, Ms. Asra, to post some from the audience to you. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Aisha. Good morning, one and all. Ma'am, we appreciate your involvement and thank you for sparing the valuable time for the session. Here uh, are a few questions uh, put forward uh, by our viewers in the chat box. I would like to bring to you to answer, ma'am. Uh, the first question, how does it feel to be a civil servant? Thank you, ma'am. to you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am, for putting across the question. Well, First of all, I feel very grateful to the Almighty for giving me the opportunity to serve my people. And at times I feel really empowered to be in the civil services because it gives you a scope to help your people. Just to quote an example, a day from my work life, a person comes in who is invalid, who is physically handicapped. And he was asking for some help as in a tricycle so that he can go across the town and do his work. And at that moment, I had referred him to the concerned department, the women and child welfare department, which also looks after people with disabilities. And thankfully, because we had the resources then, the person could get a tricycle the very day. And 
the look of happiness, the gratefulness in his eyes is what makes me grateful to be serving in the civil services. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. Next question coming up is, uh, as a lady officer, what are your initiatives towards women and child welfare? Thank you, ma'am. Well, I'm working in one of the remotest districts of my state, which itself is in the northeastern corner of India. So here we face serious issues of child marriage. Very young girls at very young ages, unfortunately, maybe in class eight to class nine and 10, they're married off. And the moment they're married off, they don't marry off like, you know, it's not, it's a culturally accepted practices that people do marry at that age. And it is also acceptable to the family. So they go on to continue the family, which itself is a very great danger, not only to the girl child, but also to her babies. So we are trying to take initiatives. We're trying to create awareness among the masses that this practice needs to be stopped with the help of the civil society with the help of the district legal, legal aid society. We're trying to do our best and hopefully in the days to come, our district will see a decline in such rates. Thank you. I really appreciate ma'am. Um, we are getting connected to you and uh, uh, we are able to know what is happening across uh, India. And uh, last question coming up your way is what changes occurred in your life after joining civil services? Yes ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Well, after joining civil services, I have become a full-time professional. Civil services leave you no time to be anything else because civil services is not just a job, it is a lifestyle. You are in and out connected with the people throughout the day, 24 seven into 12. So we have to be on our toes. We have to keep delivering to our people throughout the day, throughout the months and years. And in between, we have to connect with the family. So that is a challenge that we face as a lady officer, but that is well taken. And I'm grateful to my family to be so gracious to be accepting me as I am. Thank you so much. Uh, Ma'am, your answers has really given me goosebumps. Uh, okay. And uh, thank you so much, ma'am, for uh, putting in all the answers for the queries put up by the viewers in the chat box. Uh, I kindly request all the viewers to fill in the Google form, which has been, uh, the link has been shared in the chat box. Uh, all right. Thank you. And over to you, Aisha. Thank you, ma'am, for all your support and guidance given to the large audience by attending to the concerns so patiently during the course of the discussion. The time for us to move on. Avenir is a global career guidance event to empower students and assist them in identifying their ideal future career path. It was conceptualized by the Board of Directors of Indian Schools in Sultanate of Oman. The first Avenir was organized at Indian School Al Mabela in the year 2018. In 2019, Indian School El Seeb conducted the program. Indian School Musket conducted the first virtual Avenir in the year 2020. Avenir 2021 was conducted virtually by Indian School Al Wadi Al Kabir. In 2022, the flagship school in Oman. Indian School Bosher is all set to fly the flag higher by conducting Avenir 2022 in hybrid mode. Our impeccable planning, devoted team, unmatched resources guarantee a memorable event. The five-day event will be held from Thursday, October 13, 2022 to Tuesday, October 18, 2022. Prominent achievers, educators, and industry experts will address the audience. Universities and educational institutes from different corners of the globe will present themselves to the audience of Avenir 2022. The event is open to all educational boards, including CBSE, ICSE, 
IGCSE, and IB. It will provide comprehensive career guidance to students to pursue their passions at national and international universities. Avenir 2022 guarantees a wealth of information and awareness on 21st century courses, scholarships, internships, and career placements. This event will assist students in discovering their ideal future career path. Let us gather together for this five days of excitement, effulgence, enlightenment, exploration, and exaltation. Let's join Avenir 2022 to discover you. the time for us to move on to the second part of the session. It's time to meet the university spokesperson, Mr. Adam Bryars from the Edith Cohen University, ECU, Australia, to enlighten us with the various course and the procedures. Now let's watch a video of the university, ECU, Edith Cohen University, Australia. Inspired by the work of Edith Cowan, the first female parliamentarian in Australia and a trailblazer of her time, ECU transforms lives through education and research, giving our students the tools to take on the world. ECU is a modern, vibrant university accomplishing some pretty incredible things. Placed in the top 100 young universities worldwide, our teaching quality is consistently ranked among the best in Australia. ECU provides a supportive learning environment with world-class facilities, including some of the most advanced engineering labs in Australia. ECU gives you the business skills industry look for, whether it's social media, virtual reality or real-world finance simulations. ECU is a leader in cybersecurity education with the largest security operations centre within a university in the Southern Hemisphere. The Western Australian Academy of Performing Arts at ECU is one of the most celebrated performing arts academies in the world. ECU students receive industry-informed teaching with practical skills to tackle the problems of tomorrow, gaining real-world experience through internships and work-integrated learning. And with the new ECU City opening in the heart of Perth in 2025, our future is brighter than ever. Mr. Adam Bryars, University Spokesperson from Edith Cohen University. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much and um, namaste. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, and um, thank you very much to Avenir. Um, hashtag discover you for allowing me to be here today and also Indian School Bosha. Um, obviously you're putting, putting it on this year as well. So um, I already feel like it's an excellent event. So thank you very much. I'm also, I just wanna say, I'm, I'm here in conjunction with um, the agency, it's called Uni Student, who um, are sort of hosting me today in a way or allowing me to be here. So um, their headquarters is in Abu Dhabi, um, but I, you know, they, they, they can be in contact with you as well. So I think they have a session later later on in this, um, in Avenir. So I um, encourage you to go and see them as well because they can assist you if you have dreams of um, going to study internationally. Um, I also just want to say thank you very much to the previous speaker, uh, Miss Mazana. I, I too had goosebumps as well, um, listening to her story. And I was just thinking that if you saw the video um, our namesake for my university is Edith Cowan, and she was actually one of the first elected civil servants, female civil ser servants in Australia um, about 100 years ago. So um, I just I think there was a connection there between um, between Edith Cowan University and the previous speaker. So thank you very much. So look, today I'm just going to give you a short presentation about ECU. Okay, that's what we call my university. It's ECU, um, and I can do, we'll do some questions and answers later. So, um, 
So, um, Avenue host, can I just check that you can see my screen, please? Just double check the slide presentation. Yes. Sir. Okay, thank you. Right, so that's me, and that's my email address. If you want to grab a, a quick screenshot, if you want to talk to me later, I'll also put it in the chat. Um, my title is International Account Manager. So I actually look after the Middle East for Edith Cowan University, and I was in Muscat about two or three weeks ago um, doing some visits. So unfortunately, I didn't get to any schools, but I was there. It was very hot. I was there for the day, and um, I was also in, in the UAE as well doing some events. So I quite regularly am in the Middle East. I wasn't for a long time because our borders were closed in Australia, but things are completely normal now. Um, we're very much post-pandemic. You don't even need to show a vaccination certificate now to come to Australia. So um, it's very normalised. Um, but yeah, it's been great being back in the Middle East, although I have to be, it was, it's a bit hot compared to where I am, but that's okay. I'm sure it's not hot all the time. So these are the, what I'm going to talk about today. I'm just going to, I'm mainly going to, I'm going to talk a bit about humanities. I understand that was the theme of, of today's topic. So I'll talk about humanities courses and just some key selling points and some information for those that might be interested in studying in Australia and why you should maybe think about coming here. You have many options, you know, in the world, you've got the UK, you've got Canada, um, you can go to study in Dubai. There's many places that you can study. So hopefully I can give you some information. And for those that don't know, hopefully you, the, in your mind, you know what animal this is, because I'm sure you've done some study, but this is one of our very famous native animals and it's called a koala bear. Not really a bear, it's a, mas a marsupial, but they're called koala bears and they are very cute. Hopefully one day, if you haven't, you can come and go to a like a, um, an animal place and you can actually hold koala bears. So we are in Perth. Okay, so we are actually, so we're in Western Australia. Um, the, the very famous cities in Australia, generally to be sort of Sydney and Melbourne when I do presentations and ask students what they know about Australia. Um, they generally say Sydney and Melbourne, okay, because it's their bigger cities, they've got big populations and maybe a lot of promotion and marketing comes from those places. But we are in Perth. Um, Perth is the closest city to you, all right? So it's a direct flight from Dubai or Qatar or even Abu Dhabi when Etihad used to fly and maybe once again. So it's about 10 or 11 hours from Dubai to Perth. Um, so it is, a, a, I guess it's a reasonable time for sitting on the plane, but it's a direct flight. So for you in Oman, it's, it's very easy. It's like a short flight to Dubai or Qatar. Okay, so Doha, it's, you know, we know that's like, you know, an hour. And then from there, maybe a short layover and then hop on a plane and then, you know, 10 or 11 hours later, you come off and you're in beautiful and sunny Perth. So we're quite easy to get to. Um, I think we're about four hours ahead of Oman in terms of time. Okay, so Melbourne and Sydney would be seven hours ahead. So we're actually closer to you. And I guess one thing about Perth is that, and, and I guess this is true generally of Australia, but especially in Perth is we have a very, very high quality of living. Okay, we're, we, we're very fortunate in Australia, we're called the lucky country. And we are very lucky. So, you know, um, we have very minimal corruption here, um, which is great. So we pay our taxes and the money goes and it comes back in the form of things like our health system, our infrastructure, our education, and many other things in our day-to-day -day life. So re we really do have a good, okay? Perth has a population of about 2 million people. It's a bit smaller compared to other parts of Australia, but it just means that the life here is very easy. OK, it, for some, it does take a little bit of getting used to because it's a bit slower compared to some other big cities. But I think maybe, you know, certainly coming from like Muscat, I think you'd actually find Perth quite comfortable because, you know, Muscat is also you know, a lovely place, but it's not like a huge metropolis, like, for example, like Dubai. So I think, you'd, you know, you probably get into the pace of Perth quite quickly. But once it grabs you here, um, it's very hard to let it go because because as i said the like the life is good so so anyway it's a great it's a wonderful place to come and study um 
it's uh, we have the most hours of sunshine of any capital city in Australia. It's very outdoor lifestyle. You're into sports. We love our sports. Cricket is big here. Um, just to give an example, but many sports, you know, you'll find tennis, golf, uh, walking, beaches, riding, bicycle. I ride to work. It's about 10 kilometres from my house to work. And often I ride, it takes me about 30 minutes on my bicycle. Um, and it's great for my, my health and, you know, fitness and so forth. So it really is a good place. If you think about want to come to study somewhere, we, we are a great place to come and study. Um, and just, yeah, so we have, so our main campus is in Joondalup, which is about 30 minutes north of Perth, but we have three campuses. We have another one in Mount Lawley, which is um, closer to the city of Perth, about 15 minutes by bus. That campus has actually been closed down soon. And on the video, we're actually setting up a campus in the city centre of Perth. We're the first university to have a purpose-built campus right downtown Perth. And then we have another campus um, south of Perth by about two hours. It's in a regional area. Some international students there, but mainly that's for like domestic people in the region. So three campuses, more than 30,000 students. And at the moment, um, we probably have somewhere between four or 5,000 international students within that 31,000 students. So we have a big cohort of um, international students. Uh, probably our biggest cohort is from India. Okay, we have we have a lot of Indian students coming here right now to, to ECU, um, and, but also lots of other places as well. So in South Asia, in the Middle East, um, Southeast Asia, Africa and Europe and America. So all more than 100 countries our students come from. So it's a very international, very diverse population of students. But probably majority come from South Asia. So those are some of our key selling points. But two things I want to talk about. Are, one, very important about ECU is we've got a very supportive environment in general, learning and in general. So there's a real philosophy in this place about focusing on the student experience and I guess, you know, um, concerns that students have. So we're very well known for it. And it's something that people, when they talk about ECU, students talk about the, the, the care that they got, the attention that they got, you know, maybe from, from the lecturers, from admin staff, you know, you'll find it even the gardeners, people that work on the grounds, it's right across the whole organisation. Our focus is on student experience and we do the best we can so that our students are accommodated. We have all sorts of things like learning support, you know, career support, lots of different things that we do to try and help our students. So that's one thing. The other thing is ECU, um, we have a really good program with applied learning. So we're very good with our theory, which is, you know, you'd know about theory, but many of our courses, not just nursing or teaching, many of our courses have some sort of, we call it work integrated learning, work placement, work project, industry project, some sort of practical experience. And it generally happens in the last semester. So if you look at course structures online, you, you'll see in the last semester, you, generally there's some form of work integrated learning. So it takes on different forms. You know, it, it, it tends to be like the better, the students that do better are the ones that actually get internships and placements, but most students will get some sort of practical experience and that will help with employment, all right? So um, it's something that is, that we, a lot of universities say they do this, but I've actually worked, this is my third university now in my lifetime working in universities. And I really do believe that um, ECU delivers on that promise. The other thing I didn't mention too, is that if you do a bachelor's degree, okay, if you do a bachelor's degree, um, in Australia, the government, when you finish your degree, the government lets you stay back on a what's called a post-study work visa. So with a bachelor's degree at the moment, it's generally two years that you get to stay back. However, because we're considered regional for on not we're not regional, but on, on for migration, we actually get an extra year. So if you do a three year, three year or more study, a bachelor's degree, um, you can actually stay back three years and do post-study work three years after graduation. Although the government's now talking for some certain courses, like for example, engineering, IT, computing and IT and nursing, they're actually talking about putting that up to five years. 
of post-study work um, for, for certain course areas. So it's just getting better and better. Why? Because we need, we're a migration country. We didn't have any migration for a couple of years because of the um, border closure. So we're really desperate now for people and certainly in areas, de definitely IT um, in other areas as well. So, so for some areas, if you sort of, if you're interested and you just look at news, you'll see that there's some courses where students will actually be able to stay five years after they finish graduation and work. And working is like, you can just work, you're, you're allowed to work. So any sort of job that you can find, hopefully it's in your field, but otherwise you can work in Australia. And it might be, we just got to wait and see because we're regional, it might be for us, it might be six years because we get a bonus year because of, uh, of our status as a city. Um, we'll just have to wait and see. But bottom line is, um, at the at the moment, if you studied in Perth, you'd get minimum three years of post study work after graduation. And the other thing is that you can also work part time during your study. So at the moment, it's um, it's actually the the government studying students work full time at the moment because again, they're tapping into students for labour because we had no one coming in and we were desperate for people at the moment. So students are actually working full time. But as of next year, I think July, it's back to twenty hours a week while you're studying for part-time work, unlimited during breaks. Um, the minimum wage in Australia is $21 an hour, or $21.45. So if you do the math, um, you can actually definitely live quite, you can, as a student, you can live comfortably on your part-time work. Um, some students even manage to ma maybe use their money to pay off a bit of their fees, but we don't encourage that because, you know, that means that your studies might start to suffer. So it definitely helps to make sure that you've got some other source of income to help you with payment of your fees as well. But anyway, at the moment, times are really good when it comes to work. Um, in terms of rankings, look, I think for Times Higher Education, we just went into the top 400, which is great. We've, I think we've moved up 200 in the last couple of years. So VC is very happy, he just emailed us all today and said, congratulations, everybody. So we're, we're a young university. We're still coming. We're only 30 years now, but boy, we're doing well for a young university. We're really, we're really punching above our weight. We are for, we're in, for young universities. We're in the top 100 universities under 50 years. And, you know, another one is called this one called Quilt, Q-I-L-T, which is an Australian um, survey done by the government where for the last six years, we've topped all the public universities in Australia. That's 39, including ones like the University of Melbourne and so forth. So we've topped for uh, either our student experience or our teaching quality. Okay, and this is this is actually surveyed, this is from students. So it's the student voice for this for this particular survey. So I always say with ECU, it's, I, I think it's a good investment. We're definitely not gonna go backwards in our rankings. So if you come and study with, with us and you have an ECU degree, the degree is gonna, it's gonna get value more and more over time. Okay, it's, not, it's definitely not gonna go backwards. These are, we have many courses. These are some of our more popular courses and areas that we have, okay, that you can see there. So cyber's big for ECU, IT and so forth. Engineering, a young school, but, you know, very modern and, you know, dynamic with like really great lecturers. Um, nursing is big here, biomedical science, you know, um, exercise science. I'll talk about humanities courses. Business is our biggest course. Um, environment, teaching, and performing arts as well. So this is just a, a bit of a cross-section of our programs. What we don't have is we don't have medicine, unfortunately. We don't have dentistry. We don't have architecture. We don't have pharmacy. We don't have physiotherapy. So those are some courses, and veterinary science as well. So there are certain courses that we don't have, but we do have a lot of other courses. So just with humanities, these are probably our main courses in the it's, in, it's called in the school of arts and humanities so we've got a bachelor of arts and you can see the majors there it's a three-year degree with different majors that you can follow so it might be that you do a combination of those or a major and a minor it's up to you there's different combinations you can do um, bachelor of media and communication and you can see there the different majors um, including something like screen production so if you're interested in like you know, want to make films, we can we can accommodate that as well. So just to note that we actually have our own TV studio on our Mount Lawley campus. So we have a TV studio um, where students like, so 
We've actually got students coming in from our performing arts that do like the hosting, the TV hosting. As, um, so there's filming, there's lights, there's editing. So it's all hands-on equipment, that the same equipment that you would find in like a real studio. Um, same with anything, journalism, um, broadcasting, we have our own radio station. So it's that concept where we actually immerse the students in what it's like, what it's going to be like when they graduate. And so we start, we start from the time of their study they start to, um, you know, learn what it's going to be like when they're going to be out working, and when they do get out and start working, the hope is that they can adapt quite quickly to the to the to the work environment. Um, Counselling, social science. Um, we have a bachelor of social work too, which is a, a course of interest for international students. And then these ones are also of great, of great interest. So psychology I often get asked about criminology. Okay, so I got a bachelor of criminology and justice. Um, and you can actually put those two together and do it as a psychology, criminology and justice as well. So we've got a number of different degrees. So I know when I'm in the Middle East and especially talking to people from international schools, those courses are generally of interest. So you can see that we've got all those courses. So with psychology, a Bachelor of Psychology is a three year course. You would need to go on to do an honours, which is a fourth year. And then if you want to work as a psychologist in Australia, you would need to go and do a master's, which is another two years. So it's really six years of study to be a to be a practicing psychologist in Australia. So it's just something to keep in mind that this, this is actually the first part of it. So that's our arts and humanities. Um, we have engineering. I won't go into too, too deeply. We are ranked in the top 175 in the world for engineering. Okay. So in, in you know, within 175 universities in the world for engineering and technology. So it's a four-year course and has a number of different specializations. The ones that are really coming up now are electrical and renewable. Renewable is huge in Australia. We're really starting to make that transition to renewable power from fossil fuels. It's happening here, maybe not so good for the Omani economy, but um, it's definitely, we're definitely moving that way with the technology and you know what's available. Another really big one there is mechatronics. Okay, we're an industrial state. We're very rich in mining and oil and gas, um, not in Perth, but outside of Perth. So more and more that is being that industry is remotely, like people actually maybe operating machines like thousands of kilometers away from the industry or with petroleum subsea remote um, sea vehicles going underwater. So mechatronics is, is another um, big area here as well. Okay, but you know, mechanical, civil, chemical. They also they all have application to the industries in Western Australia. Um, we also have these are probably our, our most popular courses, which is commerce. So this is our Bachelor of Commerce, which is three years, and you get to do. We have a number of special majors that you can do. Okay, you can see them here. So you can actually choose different parts, majors, minors. Okay, according to your interests with your degree. Um, and usually there's some sort of like capstone unit at the end, which is that sort of practical side. But we also have internships as well. So I've actually um, met a number of students that have done internships and are now working. Um, but yeah, so we even have a one of we have a student in our my office, Riley. He's from the US. Um, he's an intern. He was studying here and came into our office and intern. And now now he's working full time in our office. And I'm just I always jokes like, you need to be a student, mate. You know. So I feel sad for you that you're doing full-time work now, but anyway, just shows you he was an intern and now he's working full-time with us. So, you know, it is possible. There is, you can transfer from study in, into work. Okay, so I'm almost there with my, um, ending my my course, my, my presentation. So this is um, admissions. So if you're doing the CBSE and you get 65% or above, that will um, get you into most courses at ECU, so a minimum of 65%. Some courses do have higher entry, like, for example, occupational therapy, speech pathology. Okay, therefore, you do need to get a higher degree of 78% or above. Okay, so if you do, but if you do get 78%, that will actually give you, I'll tell you in a moment, but if 65% will get you in to most of our courses, but if you get 78% or above, then you will be eligible for what's called a merit scholarship. And you'll get 20% discount off the duration, off the fee for the duration of the course. And I'll talk about that in a moment. So 
65% to get in, 78% and above will get you in, but also get you a scholarship as well. So um, also you can see with if you're doing A-levels, generally a five will get you in, all right? So you need a minimum of two A-level subjects, and you can see that if you get an A, 5, B, 4, C, 3, D, 2, E, 1. So look, not so tough to get in. Um, if you do get an eight, again, you would get a merit scholarship, okay? So you would get 20% off for the duration of your course. So um, this is quite, not, most universities use this system. The actual, the actual grades to get in will depend, will vary depending on the, on the university, but um, there's also IB as well. Um, I think it's about 24 or above will get you in. Um, and then obviously there's the, the merit scholarship too. So, so just these, these are just, I just want to give you some idea, but again, that's where it comes in. If you've got a good agent, uni student is the one that we're working with on this particular project um, they can give you advice on this no problems okay so an education agent can help you with any of this information um, and they all usually represent quite a number of universities as well so they're always a really good person to speak to i always say speak and they can help you with the visa all right with the with your student visa for whatever country you're going to um so i'm going to go back all right so with the you will need to do, so if you're doing CBSE, you'll need to do an IELTS test or equivalent PT or a TOEFL. So with IELTS, it's six, no band less than six to get into most of our courses. For PT, it's 52 with no score less than 50 will get you in. Um, if you do your A-levels and you've, or you've done your O-levels, if you do O-levels and you get a B, a C or better in your English, as a first language um, from your O levels, and that will actually meet our English language requirement. Although you may need, still need a test of English for the visa, but at least for the offer, you know, if you've done your O levels and you've got C or higher in English, then um, that waves the, waves the requirement. But CBSE, you will need to do some sort of test of English um, as well as your CBSE results. So I mentioned the merit scholarship. So remember, CBSE 78% or above, A levels 8 or above, score 8 or above. So it means that you'll get 20% off. It's automatic. It's done at the time of application. When we do the assessment, we assess for scholarship at the same time. If you get it, it'll be on the letter of offer. So 20% is going to save you somewhere around about 7,000 Australian dollars a year. Okay, so it depends on the course, different courses cost different amounts. So for example, engineering IT costs a bit more, business humanities courses cost a bit less, but you're going to save with, with that with that scholarship, if you get a merit scholarship, you're going to save about 20,000, uh, sorry, about $7,000 a year. So the fee is going to be somewhere around 26, 27, 28,000 Australian dollars a year. Okay. So I'm sorry, I can't do the calculations into reals because my brain doesn't work that way, but so if you can just say, let's say, just 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 if you're going to pick a number, let's say about let's say about twenty seven thousand Australian dollars a year, twenty seven thousand. If you can remember that and convert it, I think at the moment with US dollars, I think that's somewhere maybe around about eighteen thousand US dollars a year at the moment, somewhere around that. Okay, with the current exchange rate. So that's that's with the scholarship. So that's why you got to work hard. Um, generally, most universities in Australia will give you some scholarship based on merit. So the better that you do in your schooling, the better, the better chance that you have of getting some sort of fee relief, some discount from your course. So just keep that in mind, okay, and work hard. But we, that, that's our scholarship. It's, good. it's a merit scholarship. We do have other scholarships, but I'm sort of trying to pick the one which is best for the, the, um, for the platform, for, the, for the, the people that might be watching today. But we do have others as well. Um, you can also talk to a student. So again, maybe grab a quick screenshot if you can, if you want to, or grab your phone. Um, so you can actually talk to our students. Um, they're ambassadors and you can go online and chat to them if you go to that webpage. Two of our current ambassadors are Indian students. So you can actually talk to Indian students currently studying at ECU and ask them all sorts of questions, anything that you can think of. That's what they're there for. So we have about 12 students in total that are ambassadors and maybe at any one stage, there might be five or six online that are um, there to chat. So 
through this website, you can actually chat to a current ECU student and quite likely from your own home country as well, um, or maybe from the subject area that you're interested in. So what better way to find out than actually talking to our current students um, to get some information about about studying it, about being at ECU and also like living in Perth and maybe confirming some of the things I said today so you can think that I'm telling the truth. Um, one last thing is we, um, our government, our state government is very wealthy at the moment as far as government goes. Um, there, was no, there was no COVID in Perth. They managed to avoid it right up until the start of this year when they opened up. So it meant that the um, industries were all going through the, the time of the pandemic I mentioned we're very strong in mining. We're very, we're very rich in iron ore and also things like lithium. China has big demand for iron ore. So we were selling iron ore the whole time of the pandemic. So through royalties, our government has billions of dollars and they're actually giving it, some of it back to international students at the moment. So you can see there students, this was for semester two, um, semester two this year. They're, they're actually giving those subsidies back. Students can apply for subsidies to get money back um, from, from the government to help with their setup costs. And um, it should be from semester 123, not 22, because semester 122 is already gone. So it might be, so we've had these two, two semesters now. So it just might be that the, the government offers it again next semester as well. So I guess just, just keep an eye on it, you know. Um, so we do. So I just wanted to point out that that we're actually giving money back to international students at the moment, which I think is great. And also there's Study Perth is like a group, government group that represents all the universities in Perth and Western Australia. Um, and also, um, you know, just talks about Perth as a destination. So really great website. You can register to updates and so forth. So that's why I put it there just to tell people about Study Perth and you know, find it and and sign up for newsletters and so forth. So that's it from me. One thing I'm going to do right now is I'm going to, um, I was going to, I don't know if I can do it. Um, I was going to put myself for, uh, put my email in, which I'll do, but maybe, our hosts can help to pass that on to the um, to the to the audience, and that's me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the informative session, and we are sure that the process of exploring and inquiring has begun in the minds of my friends and parents. I am sure there is bound to be a few questions. Uh, let us take up one or two of them. Uh, over to the moderator. Thank you, Sainaba. Uh, thank you, sir, for giving us a great insight into ECU. Here, I have a few questions in the chat box for you to answer. The first question is, what services are offered to the students who need extra support, uh, like in the form of tuition? That's a really great question. I, I really get that question. Um, thank you very much for that one. So yeah, look, again, like I said, we, we really focus on the student experience. So we actually have a whole learning support center in the university, like it's a, a group of people. So there's actually specialists in learning support. So um, if students are having issues, you know, they generally talk to their course coordinators or their teachers and they'll get directed to our learning support center. So um, things like, you know, like assignment writing, time management. Um, I think we have some language support too. If you still need maybe some, I, I, I doubt whether anyone on this in this audience will need that from English language point of view, I don't think that would be an issue, but you know, some, some students need that, you know, they're still maybe not quite right with the, the English that they have um, for the study. So, yeah, so we do, we, we, have, we have a learning support unit and we, um, we provide like, you know, it's, it depends on the needs of the students. And we even like with students, some students have disabilities, like they need like, you know, someone to take notes or whatever. We, we have all that as well. Like, we do, it's, it's, it's the way that it works in Australia. Um, you know, especially we, we make sure that, we try and make sure that everyone has the same opportunity. So yeah, look, I think, I, I, you know, it's, if you need help, you'll find it. All right, next question coming your way is, uh, 
what academic programs in your college uh, are most known for? Wow, another excellent question. Thank you very much. So um, I would say for us, like, I don't want to discount the ones I spoke about, like our arts and humanities courses, but probably for ECU, um, we're really big in cyber. Um, we're, we're one of the pioneers of cybersecurity in Australia from a teaching point of view. We're one of two universities recognised for academic excellence by the Australian government. The other one's the University of Melbourne. So um, cyber's big, nursing's big. Um, engineering is sort of up and coming with us, but I think, you know, it's something that we do really well. Uh, we really know, we, before we were a university, we actually were a group of advanced colleges of education and our specialty was um, educating teachers for the state of Western Australia. So um, we're really known for our education as well. But look, um, you know, look, I think, we're strong in so many different areas. If you look at, you know, we're in the top 100 for sports science. Um, I think we just got a ranking in the top 30 for our tourism and hospitality with with um, with uh, one of the Chinese rankings. So, you know, but yeah, look, cyber, engineering, nursing, um, education, some of the courses that we're, we're really, really well known for. All right, thank you, sir. Uh, one more question is, what is the average size of introductory courses? Any fixed strength is there for the classroom size? Sorry, are you talking about the number of students in a class? Yes, sir. Okay. Wow, another really good question. Um, look, we don't, we tend to, like I remember when I, used, when I went to university, I used to go, I, I did a Bachelor of Science and I remember doing like chemistry lecture and there'd be like 500 people in the lecture theatre. So we don't, like we're still, we don't, we don't like, you know, it might be some some lectures, if they're if say say that unit is required for different courses. So then you might have, you know, you might have a couple of hundred students in a lecture. But I, I think generally a, a class size is going to be like for a tutorial, you'll probably have maybe, you know, 15, 20 people maximum. That that would be the normal tutorial. Like I can't imagine, you know, like if we, we if we had too many people in there, then that's going to affect the student experience, isn't it? So we need to be really careful. So I think like a tutorial, maybe like max, you know, maybe 10, 15, 20. And then in the lectures, you know, you might have, you may, maybe up to a couple of hundred, depending on, depending on the unit. But bottom line is, is that like you will get, that's the thing about this university, which is special about is that like, you know, students like, you're not a number. I mean, I know it's a stereotype, but um, you know, we really do, you know, like we really do focus on the students needs. So um yeah, so you don't get lost. All right. The last question for you, sir, is uh, you have mentioned some requirements for the students, okay, to get the admission, to complete mm. the admission process, right? So are there any additional requirements uh, at the time of admission apart from what you have mentioned? Now? No. So the main, the, 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 big, the big thing is having an official transcript of your year 12 results, whatever that might be. So your CBSE certificate that we know very well here, or like the actual final results of your A-levels or your IB certificate, or if you've done the American system, you know, um, your high school diploma and SATs or AP results. So, you know, that they're, they're, so we need the official, not just provisional, that's got to be official. I mean, you can apply with provisional, but then the offer will most likely be conditional on the final results. So that's very important. And then the other thing would be a test of English if it's required. So those are the two. We don't know. I know there's, I hear about tests that some universities require. We don't, it's, it's the transcripts and the English are the main ones um, for most of our courses. Uh, so uh, there are many questions flowing up. Shall I put up sure. one more question? Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm look, it's up to you. I'm, I've got time. It depends on your time. All right. Okay. Now, what are the humanities courses and what are the scholarship offers? So the one, the main, it really comes down to those ones I mentioned, although there are some I didn't mention. So if you remember, I talked about, um, so I talked about the Bachelor of Arts. I talked the Bachelor of Media and Communications. I introduced like social work, social science, youth work. Um, I spoke about psychology. I spoke about criminology and justice. Um, we also have, um, you can do a Bachelor of Design, which is a three-year course. And we have different specializations, including um, like gaming, uh, gaming, interactive interactivity, 
specialization and then i believe we have fashion and i think visual design as well so that's another course that we have so again it comes down to that they, they all have that scholarship so we only have the one scholarship but if you can get it the merit scholarship that i mentioned you're going to get 20 percent off so for those courses with the merit scholarship you're looking around about at the moment around about maybe 26,000, 27,000 Australian dollars a year um, over three years for that course. So, so, and really, as I mentioned, one thing, and it really applies to all those courses is wherever there's some practical component required within the course, we're gonna do it times 10, okay? We really like, we really focus on those practical skills as well as the theoretical skills because we want you to be ready for work and like I said, a lot of people do say they do this, but I think it's something that ECU really delivers on well. Last question, so that is, uh, uh, the university also supports the students in completing the application and visa process in completing that process? No, so that's where either you're gonna do it yourself, like you just, you can apply directly, but for certain countries, so for example, if you're, if you hold an Indian passport, then, you must go through an education agency. And I'm sure, I know, I know, I know, I mean, I'm, I, so with this session, I'm working, I'm working with uni student, okay? So um, yeah, so they're, they're in Abu Dhabi, um, but they, um, I'm sure there's a way that you can connect with them. And I, I believe they're doing an information session. Um, so yeah, so you, the, you can either do it direct or if, you know, certain passports, you have to find an agency. So they will help you. Okay, that's that they will help you with, they'll help you with your application and they'll help you with your visa as well. So um, that's why I always recommend a really good education agent. Right, thank you so much, sir. Uh, hope all our viewers had got the answers and uh, sir had also given his uh, email ID directly you can communicate further if uh, any clarification required and uh, i request once again all the viewers to fill in the google form link that has been posted in the chat box for the e-certificate and uh, miss marzana hussein is once again back she wants to just have some words few words with the uh, adam sir over to you marzana ma'am thank you ma'am I'm taking the stage once again with the kind permission of our moderator and especially take this opportunity to once again thank the Indian School Boucher and Mr. Adams, thank you very much for your enlightening session and thank you personally for referring to me in your speech. I'm uh -huh. thrilled. Goosebumps. Goosebumps. <laughs> <Thank you much. laughs> We hope to stay in touch. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Lovely to meet you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Marzana, and thank you, sir. Over to you, Aisha. Thank you very much for the insightful answers. We have many queries, and yes, the students can access the mobile app, and the questions will be directly addressed. As we draw the end of this enriching session, I deem it my great privilege to propose the word of thanks. We extend our heartfelt thanks to our eminent speaker, Ms. Mirzana Hussein, for all her words of motivation. Thank you, ma'am. We express a gratitude for Mr. Adam, spokesperson for the ECU, for sharing us details and giving us an overview of the career guidance. Thank you, sir. A deeper sense of appreciation and gratitude to Chairman Dr. Sivakumar Manikim and the members on the Board of Directors, India Schools in Amman. Our heartfelt thanks to the President, Mr. Ajay Payara, and the members of the Indian School Bausha's School Management Committee and the principal of the school, Dr. Bhavesh Balarao. Heartfelt thanks to our platinum sponsor, gold sponsors, silver sponsors, and bronze sponsors, digital marketing partner, Spectrum and Trifoil, media partner, the Arabian Stories and Value Donors, support sponsors.
An event of this kind requires the coordination of a committed team. Thank you to the ISP team for making Avenir 2022 possible. Thank you to the teachers, students, and parents for being a part of this session. Shoot for the moon. Even if you miss, you land among the stars. Quoted by Les Brown. With these uplifting words, I are Shafatim. And I, Sainabhasata, wish you all a glorious day ahead. Before we sign off, let me remind you of the upcoming sessions. The upcoming sessions are 30 a.m. to four sessions on the four streams, science, engineering, humanities, and commerce. You can provide your feedback on the Avenir website, www.avenirauman.com. Every attendee who submits the feedback form will receive a digital certificate. See you in the next session. Stay tuned and stay safe. Avenir is a global career guidance event to empower students and assist them in identifying their ideal future career path. It was conceptualized by the Board of Directors of Indian Schools in Sultanate of Oman. The first Avenir was organized at Indian School Al Mabela in the year 2018. In 2019, Indian School El Seeb conducted the program. Indian School Musket conducted the first virtual Avenir in the year 2020. Avenir 2021 was conducted virtually by Indian School Al Wadi Al Kabir. In 2022, the flagship school in Oman. Indian School Bosher is all set to fly the flag higher by conducting Avenir 2022 in hybrid mode. Our impeccable planning, devoted team, unmatched resources guarantee a memorable event. The five day event will be held from Thursday, October 13, 2022, to Tuesday, October 18, 2022. Prominent achievers, educators, and industry experts will address the audience. Universities and educational institutes from different corners of the globe will present themselves to the audience of Avenir 2022. The event is open to all educational boards, including CBSE, ICSE, IGCSE, and IB. It will provide comprehensive career guidance to students to pursue their passions at national and international universities. Avenir 2022 guarantees a wealth of information and awareness on 21st century courses, scholarships, internships, and career placements. This event will assist students in discovering their ideal future career path. Let us gather together for this five days of excitement, effulgence, enlightenment, exploration, and exaltation. Let's join Avenir 2022 to discover you.